You can turn to Psalm 112, 112, verse 5. Psalm 112, verse 5. You notice there's still one big screen in the back behind me. Eventually, we're, Lord willing, going to two screens back there. We'll get that thing out of the way, and, and they'll be able to see the, the cross back there lit up all nice-like, maybe a little easier viewing for those down front here. And uh, that, should be, that should be coming pretty quick here. And then working on some things for faith-building offerings, so more information to follow. So, but Psalm chapter 1, Psalm 112, verse 5, as we now move on in our lesson on disciples or being a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is lesson number 6. Now, most of you will not remember where we're at in this because I stopped doing this about the middle of May. All right, and then summer hit on uh, Tuesday night, and this summer was tremendous. I loved those preachers we had in. I was blessed, and uh, I was touched. Everyone that I heard touched my heart, and uh, the point is always for it to touch someone else's heart, not my heart, okay? You know, leave me alone, touch somebody else. No, of course not. It was great, and what a blessing. But now we're back in, and here's how this is going to work. I've got lesson six and lesson seven. All right, just two left. Once we're done with that, it'll lead right into our discipleship material for First Baptist Church. And I'm excited as we begin now to actively and heavily disciple people who have been saved and now need to grow in the Lord. And there's some great things we're doing, more information to follow, but it's exciting. So we got this lesson, the next one's on making disciples, we'll go right into it, probably about four weeks away. You see how much material is in that book, right? There is no way I'm getting through that tonight. No way. But we'll give it a whirl. All right, fair enough. If you look there at the very top, kind of a recap, lesson number one was a disciple, being a follower or a follower of a ruler or a philosopher. We're called to be disciples. All right, we're called to follow whom? Jesus Christ. All right, we're supposed to be like him, not like me, not like your mom, not like your dad, except as they follow Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. He's the example, be a follower, disciple of Jesus Christ. Number two was dedication to others, an unselfish, sacrificial love for others. As we grow, number three, a disciplined life. Number four, dependability, uh, doing what I ought to do. And number five, discernment, ability to see people and circumstances as they really are. And now number six, number six, as we continue on, discretion. That's the word there, discretion. The ability to avoid words, actions, and attitudes which are not right. The first blank is discretion. Tonight we're going to look at discretion, the ability to avoid words, actions, and attitudes which are not right. If you would look at Psalm 112, verse 5, you can open your Bible. It's printed in your booklet as well. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with, help me, discretion. Even if you weren't looking, you could probably figure out what word was going to be based on the outline tonight. Proverbs 1, verse 4. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. Proverbs 2, verse 11. What's the first word? Discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. And Ephesians 4, 29 and 30. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Lord, I thank you for your word and for this time. Lord, I ask you'd help us now, that you'd help me as I begin to teach and explain and, and talk about these things. Lord, that you would help me to say those things that would uh, illuminate and show the Scripture, Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit would take uh, the truth from your word and it, you would touch hearts. Lord, help us not to reject but to embrace the truth you have for us. Lord, may you grow us and change us. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Using discretion. My dad's here, and one of his favorite dad jokes growing up was a joke that we always referred to as the half-head of lettuce joke. Discretion. The joke goes like this. There was a, a man, or I'm sorry, a lady who came into a grocery store, and she says to the, to, the, to the produce manager there, she goes, I'd like to buy a half a head of lettuce. As the joke goes on, that the, uh, the food service guy, the, the food manager, the produce manager said, ma'am, 
the whole head is on sale. He goes, just buy the whole head and you can cut it in half. No, 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 sir. I want a half a head of lettuce. Will you sell me half a head of lettuce? He said, ma'am, we don't sell half a head of lettuce. We sell a whole head. They're on sale. Just buy one, cut it in half. You have a half a head of lettuce. No, sir. I want a half a head of lettuce. Will you ask your manager? So as a joke goes, this guy goes back to his manager. He doesn't realize that the lady has followed him back to the office. And he goes back and he says, listen, Bill, this idiot out there is trying to, be, to buy a half a head of lettuce. And then he turns around and sees the lady. And he says, and this nice lady wants to buy the other half. <laughs> well, they got the lady taken care of. She walked away. And Bill, the manager, said, wow. He goes, that was really smooth. That was really smooth. He said, you turned that, that situation right around. Boy, that was great. He said, yeah, Bill. He goes, I've always known that, that ladies from Ohio... All right, are either dumb or play football. Bill says, my wife is from Ohio. He says, what team does she play for? <laughs> Just a joke, and affectionately referred to as the half head of lettuce joke. You ever opened your mouth and inserted your foot? Ever opened your mouth and inserted both feet? Ever opened your, opened your mouth and sort of both feet, an arm, a leg, and a truck, a Mack truck? Discretion. They say you never ask a lady if she's pregnant. Discretion. Maybe you've seen someone and said, hey, how was your father? I want to realize that their father has passed. And through an accident, you know, through no ill intent, you're now in a really tough situation. And discretion. I want to talk tonight about this concept of discretion, the ability to avoid words, and not only words, actions and attitudes which are not right. Psalm chapter 1, verse 112, verse 5, if you look back at that verse there, uh, you'll see that, that it says that the ending word is, a good man showeth favor and lendeth, he will guide his affairs with discretion. That next blank there, that long line there, is in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament. The Old Testament, this particular word in Psalm chapter 112, verse 5, is used 421 times in 406 verses. All right, so some verses have it twice, obviously. So 421 times in the Old Testament, this particular word that's shown here as discretion is used in the Old Testament. It's sometimes translated in your notes here, you'll see judgment. And they made this judgment this discretion, this decision, and it was a good judgment. It's often used, uh, or many times used, around the temple, and they fashioned or fashioned this. It was uh, 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 the idea that what they were doing with the temple and how they were building it was, was correct. They had, to, they had to carve some things, so they made a decision, and they made it look beautiful. They fashioned it. Or, it was translated this way, according to the manner or the right way. It refers to making a choice and choosing properly. Making a choice and choosing properly. That's discretion. Discretion, when to open your mouth and when to shut your mouth. There are times to say something and there are times to say nothing. Honey, does this dress make me look fat? Discretion. Discretion. I heard years ago that, that somebody said, no, honey, uh, that dress doesn't make you look fat. You are fat. Not so much discretion. Not so much discretion. And discretion, knowing when to say something. Sometimes when someone has been in a very tough situation, you're there and you feel this awkward silence. There may be crying. Maybe you're in a hospital room. If you're not careful, you will want to start saying things. Discretion, don't. Don't. Because well-meaning people say, if I can, very dumb things. Oh, it's all right. You'll get over this. Really. Things like this. I know how you feel. Do you? Now, we think because maybe this person lost their, 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 a member of their family and you lost a similar person that you will feel the same way. That's not true, is it now? The relationship is different. You're different. They're different. And, and all you know is that you know the, tr the trouble that you traveled through and you know that they're traveling through. So to say, I know how you feel is not a very uh, good use of discretion. 
You don't know. God does, but, but we don't know. But this word is, is translated to, to choose properly. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 4, if you look back up to that verse, it says to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge, and that same word, discretion. That's actually a different word in the Hebrew right there. That word is only used in 19 times in 19 verses. Though they're both discretion, there's slightly different, a different aspect of that. In fact, that discretion in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 4 can be good or bad. The same word is used in Proverbs 14, 17. Proverbs 14, 17 has the exact same word. It says this, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. That word devices is the exact same word. Proverbs 1, verse 4 says discretion. So the second idea behind this word discretion, as we see it in Scripture, is that it can go either direction or evil choices. You see, someone who lacks discretion, someone who doesn't make proper choices, the Scripture's telling us, is not a loved person. If someone is always sticking their foot in their mouth, then you don't want them around when you get into trouble, do you? Because you know they're going to do something that lacks discretion. You don't want them with you in a sticky situation because they may run their mouth and then you got a problem. It was years ago, we church took a trip to the Tigers game. We took that old tour bus that we had. It was on the way back that we were getting back on the tour bus and we were getting on there and we happened to pass some of the fans of the team that we played that day. I don't remember who it was. I want to say it was the Cleveland Indians, but I do not remember. Some of you remember who we played. I don't enjoy baseball that much, but I enjoyed the game there. enjoyed being with the church family. Unfortunately, the uh, Cleveland fans seem to be a little bit intoxicated. Maybe they had a little too much to drink at the baseball game. And they began to run their mouth to some of the people from our church as we got back on this tour bus. And I remember that one of our church members began to answer as they ran their mouth. And all of a sudden, we had a little sticky situation on our hands. That's not the person you want with you in a sticky situation, is it now? That's not the one you want. Now, those people can be good at times, wind them up like a toy and push them, all right, and stand back and watch. But what Proverbs 14, uh, verse 17 tells us, that a man of wicked discretion or wicked, or wicked devices or evil choices, he's hated, he's rejected, he's shunned. You don't want this guy around. And so as we look at how it applies now to a Christian, this idea of having discretion, the right kind of discretion, making the right kind of choices is paramount in our life because we're supposed to be salt and light in this world. And we can hurt our testimony for Jesus Christ if we lack discretion. There's another definition, that next blank definition. If you were to Google this or look up in a dictionary, discretion, the quality of behaving or speaking in such a way as to avoid causing offense. We can look at offense two ways. Number one, offense toward God. Offense toward God. We can say and do things that causes an offense toward God. I see that in Scripture. I look back in, in the very first book and I see Adam as he answers God in the garden lacks discretion. When God says, Adam, did you eat of this fruit? Did you make a mistake? Adam lacks discretion. He doesn't say, yes, sir, I did it. He says, the woman that thou gavest me, it's your fault, God. Let me just give you a point. It's never good discretion to blame God. It didn't work in the garden. It doesn't work today. All right? And so Adam says, God, really it's your fault. If you hadn't made, if you hadn't, you know, made Eve, you know, then we wouldn't be in the situation, God, you and me, we'd, we'd be okay. And God says, no, 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 not, not so quick, Adam, not so quick. I see, well, how else we going to offend God? I look at the life of Peter. And Peter was uh, seeming a man who lacked discretion at times. There are times that he was knocking it out of the park. Flesh and blood hadn't, hadn't given this to you, they taught you this truth. But the Spirit of God, and almost, and almost it seems like 10 seconds later, get thee behind me, Satan. 
Peter's even either knocking out of the park or getting knocked to the ground. Discretion. But not only offenses toward God, we can have offenses toward others. And largely when we talk about discretion, we're talking about offenses toward others. There are two phrases down there just to remember. One, I shouldn't live my life in fear of others. Believe it or not, most of you at First Baptist Church have an idea of what a pastor should do. How I should dress. There are certain things that if I showed up here, you'd be like, why are you wearing that? What I should drive. You're driving a foreign truck? It's a Chevy? You didn't buy your wife a Ford. Wait for it. You should have a motorcycle. Everyone knows that men of God don't have motorcycles. No, no, no. Everyone knows men of God don't have Harleys. But Honda CBRs, those are godly, okay? It's discretion. It's discretion, Brother Bador. It's discretion. I'm, I'm just kidding with you. I've ridden your bike. It's a beautiful bike he has. But you have an idea. You have an opinion. And let me give you one other secret. They're not all the same. If I tried to please every person in here, I would be a mess. I'd be a mess. I have half of this on and half of that on. I have half my car would be this and the other half would be this and the roof would be this and this tire and this brand and this tire on the other side. And, and it, it'd just be absolutely ridiculous, right? If we're not careful, because we don't want to cause offense of others, then we live in fear of others. And we don't live in fear. We have to live in fear of God. Not a scared fear, but a righteous, holy fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So a reverence, God, I want to please you. And if someone along the way says, well, I don't think you should do that, then I, I check where I'm at, but i got to make sure I please the Lord. When my wife went back to teaching, some people were like, I don't think your wife should teach. Wonderful. I appreciate that. Other people, good people, I think it's wonderful your wife is teaching. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. You know how I made the decision? And my wife, we saw God's face. When you see God's face, there's security there. Because I don't want to cause offense toward God. So if God says do something, we do it. For we ought to obey God rather than man. So we don't live in fear of other people. If you say, Pastor Howell, I don't like your beard. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My wife does. And to be honest, I like her more than most of you. <laughs> All right? Thank you, brother and Cecil. Amen. I kiss her. I don't kiss you. <laughs> I thought I'd get an amen for that one. There we go. There we go. That being said, that being said, there are some people who take that concept and don't use, what's our word tonight? Discretion. And they say things like this, well, forget you. You don't matter. I only answer to God. So it doesn't matter what I do. Well, you know what? In Scripture, there's another concept taught. That Look, it's on your paper there, that I shouldn't live my life forgetting others. Because Paul said, to the Jew I became a Jew, to the Greek a Greek, that I might win some, save some, help some. So Paul says, while I live in fear and reverence of God himself, I also live with the idea that I'm supposed to be a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ while I'm on this earth. So I am an example, and, and the choices I make do affect other people. There are some things that I, I'm talking about me, not figuratively, but realistically, that I will not do because I don't want to be a problem for other people. It may be okay before the Lord, but I think my testimony is bigger than my personal freedom and liberty. Can I preach in a t-shirt? Yes or no? Absolutely. All right, is that violating any scriptural principle if I, teach in, if I preach in a t-shirt? Nothing that I can see in scripture that says, thou shalt not preach in a t-shirt. In fact, I have one on under my dress shirt. So it's obviously scriptural. But would it be helpful for me to show up Sunday morning in a t-shirt? It wouldn't be helpful now, would it? I have the liberty to do that. I could do that. But it's not going to be profitable. It's not going to be helpful. So I use discretion. As you walk down this road with discretion... You'll find that at times you'll stumble left and right and left and right. Isn't that life, though? 
Is it seeking the Lord's face and realizing we are but flesh and blood? And, and I'm trying to seek the Lord's face. And as a pastor, as church, as believers, we seek God's face and try to live this life with our family and with our wives, with our husbands, with our jobs. And, and sometimes we say, you know what? I blew it. But I'm going to seek God's face. Discretion. So that's kind of the, the concept as we talk about this discretion, discretion. I have a few things inside of this, but that's the concept. That we live this life free of offense before God and before man. Ultimately, we ought to please God rather than man. By pleasing God, we will cause offense at times. When we call sin, sin, that will be unfortunately offensive. It will be. But I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go out blasting people just to be a jerk. There's a there's a, a, a church not too far away who's having a big conference on why they, I want to say why they, they hate Islam, okay, but why they're against it, but they, they, they said some things that were, it's a Baptist church, unfortunately, and they said some things that were just not filled with discretion. All right, God is love. God is also truth. He is both things. And sometimes we sacrifice one for the other. They're those guys who are just God is love, and, and there is no mention of sin or error or anything, just God loves you. God loves you. That's all you need to know. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. But don't forget that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is divisive naturally. There are things that are true and things that are not true. By, by meaning of that is some things are true and some things are wrong. All right, if I say gravity does not exist, that is wrong. And if I say gravity doesn't exist and I throw you, then you feel the consequence of my error. It's not true and someone else has suffered. If I say gravity is not true and I, I jump, then I feel the consequence of that. So in this life, as we speak truth, all right, there will be offense. Well, I, I, don't, I don't want to believe in gravity. I, in fact, I reject that theory because no one can tell me what to do. I'm bigger than anything else in the universe. I get to make my own decisions and no matter where or how I was born, I don't believe in gravity. Wonderful. Jump. Then you'll believe. Now, gravity, we can see today. God's truth, some of it we'll see someday. The problem is that some people in this world, or many people in this world, are jumping and denying God's truth, gravity. And they're saying, look at me. I'm fine. Yes, you are. Right now. You're fine. Right now. But my Bible says that there is a come a day that every knee shall bow. Ours, out of reverence and some out of, out of, um, out of, of God's commandment, but every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, all right, that Jesus is God. He is Lord. All right, at some point in history, in the future, someone or everyone will bow to Jesus Christ and will acknowledge that he is truth. All right, so people are jumping, and, and if we say, hey, you're jumping, hey, God loves you, you're jumping, here's a net, they're like, oh, I don't like your net. Who died and made you God? Nobody. And Jesus died, but didn't make him God, he was God and is God. Here's a net. So understand that as we use discretion, as we speak the truth, we will unfortunately cause offense, but I don't want to cause offense unnecessarily. I don't, need, I don't need to go picket funerals. I don't need to, to drive a truck down the road that says, God hates, fill in the blank. All right, I want to show love and truth. So look at discretion. We'll look here, the first one the night, letter A, how to control and use speech positively. How to control and use speech positively. James 3 verse 5 says this, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little, little fire kindleth. Proverbs 21, 23, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Proverbs 19, 11, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Let's talk about this for a second here. Let me be real transparent. You may not know this, but I can be sarcastic. Oh, now you're hurting my feelings. That wasn't discretion. 
Believe it or not, uh, my sarcasm has gotten me in trouble before. Yeah, do you believe that, Mrs. Winters? She doesn't believe it. What a good lady. I like you. I like you. You know what we like to do, though? We like to look at someone else's problem and amplify theirs and ignore our own. Some of you are not sarcastic, and you don't like that. Sorry. Sarcasm is actually in the Bible. True. True. Jesus used it. Paul used it. Look at it. It's in the Bible. It is not used uh, in the Bible uh, as a way to use the flesh, but it is used in the Bible. But some of you are not sarcastic, but some of you are gossips. Well, you wouldn't be sarcastic. You'll run your mouth all day about somebody else. That's not discretion now, is it? Some of you are not gossips. Some of you aren't, aren't sarcastic, but you're liars. You're not, you're not truthful when you speak. That's not discretion now, is it? Some of you are, are not uh, sarcastic, and some of you are not gossips, some of you are not liars, but uh, some of you don't have an off switch ever. Let everyone be swift to hear, slow to speak. And some people uh, don't not have an off switch and aren't sarcastic and aren't gossips and aren't liars, but um, you are what you call truth bearers. You speak your mind whenever you feel like it. You met these people before as well? I've often said when I get older, I hope I get that trait. I have this little, little known fact. I probably should not share this because it's going to come back to bite me, Mrs. Dalton. But I should never take Benadryl. Your frontal lobes are, are kind of the devices that kind of like filter what you think. And you don't say things often because your frontal lobes, that's why people with lobotomy have some issues. For whatever reason, as, as much as I can identify this fact, that Benadryl seems to turn off my frontal lobes so that I speak what I'm thinking. You may think I'm sarcastic now. You don't want me on Benadryl. <laughs> I remember the first time that I realized this happened, I was in college, about to take a Greek test, and I actually did fairly well in Greek, mostly, um, not mostly, I think I got complete A's in Greek, except for this one test that I took. It was a vocabulary test. I had studied diligently or whatever diligently looks like to a college student and uh, knew the vocabulary. And I had a little allergic reaction, and I'm sure it was my mother. I'll blame her again. Uh, my mother said, you know, whatever, take some Benadryl. That's like the easy answer, right? You have an allergic reaction, take Benadryl. So I took this Benadryl and then went to take this Greek test. I sat down to this Greek test, and I looked at it. Mine's a little bit foggy, okay, which is a, was, a, was a rarity in Greek class because I enjoyed Greek uh, and, the, and the vocabulary and the words. And I thought, ah, you know what? I studied this, but I don't remember it right now. I looked at it for about another minute. It's all in about the first three or four minutes of class. I said, you know what? I don't really care about this test. And I turned it in. Blank. Not so good. That's when I began to realize that, that Benadryl does something weird to me. I then began to realize that I would just say, like, it like ekes out. All right, we're at camp, and the teens were up there, was it at Pleasant Valley Youth Camp, probably nine, ten years ago. Another allergic reaction. I had forgotten about the first one. And I think it was somebody, maybe it might have been Mr. Dalton that day that said, hey, take this Benadryl. I'm sure it was you, Mr. Dalton, that day. I'm positive. The camp nurse. And uh, take this Benadryl. Well, I took this Benadryl, and my wife came up, and uh, she came up to see me, and it had been gone for a couple days, and she came up to see me, and, and she's calling to me like a little, a little ways away. Now, I am not a yeller. When we got married, my wife said, I just asked that, that, you not, that we not yell at each other. And that's, you know, I have many faults, but yelling like that is not, not I, I don't yell, okay? Well, she's, she's calling me, and I remember in my mind and my spirit, like, getting super, super irritated, okay? And then she, because she said my name, like, twice. Then she said it, like, again. And I'm, like, over the top. And I, Zach, were you there that day? I think you might have been. Oh, okay, I, I bet you were, but, but I yelled at her. I yelled at my wife. All right, and I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you calling me? She's like, yeah, the teen's like, oh, and I'm like, whoa. And I, I remember thinking that day, why am I yelling? I'm not that upset. Why am I yelling? Now, I don't want to blame Benadryl, but it's Benadryl that makes me do this stuff. Don't give me Benadryl. Especially don't slip it in my food right before I preach, because it could be, oh boy, <laughs> when anybody left in church. I apologized to her. In fact, I apologized to the teens that night. I said, listen, I am sorry. I said, you know, I said, it's my fault, but uh, 
but, but this, <laughs> this Benadryl does weird things to me. But we're quick to look at other people's problems, their errors, their faults, and say, well, listen, you're a gossip, that's terrible, as we are deceitful and lie. You're a truth bearer as I'm sarcastic. You yell, you get angry. But the answer is, none of us are using discretion. Because the purpose is to use speech to honor the Lord and not cause offense toward God or toward others. I want to control and use my speech positively. There's a quote there from Calvin Coolidge on your paper. It says this, I have never been hurt by anything I didn't say. That's a good quote. That should go up in our cars, on our phone back screen before you text. It should go on your, as a Facebook profile picture before you answer a Facebook post or before you post on Facebook. I've never been hurt by anything I didn't say. Here are four questions to ask yourself to make sure you, you're using discretion. Number one, is it the right time or the right place? There are things that need to be said, but you can always say them. You can never unsay them. If you're not sure, why don't you wait? It may not be the right time or the right place. It may not be the right place to, to stand up in the middle of church and talk to your spouse. I'm sick and tired of you. I remember once I was in uh, a teenager, it was school camp, or we Camp Kobiak that year, and the, the preacher said, listen, he goes, if someone's talking next to you during this camp, I want you to stand up and say, shut up. Now that would work. That would stop someone from talking at camp. But I don't think there's much discretion there, right? The right time or the right place. There are other methods. The second question there, is it worth saying? There are some things that are better left unsaid. Third one, will this hurt someone? Now remember this, will it hurt someone? That faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Definitely as Christians, we are called to speak the truth in love. And to speak at the right spirit, the right time, and the right place, but... But we're not called to just say, oh, no, that's no big deal. Don't worry about that or just zip our mouths and walk away and tell somebody else, boy, that's, look at that problem over there. We're called to be truth bearers. And sometimes it'll hurt someone, but for the right reason, not causing offense for the wrong reason. And number four, does this hurt me? You see, God wants us to use our tongue. This little member, as James 3 verse 5 says, that boasteth great things and can kindle a little fire. This little member can also be very profitable. This little member of the tongue in the speech can give the gospel. This little tongue can exhort, can encourage, can uplift. It's not just negative, it's positive. As we use discretion, God can take our speech. And we have in our pews this little card called apples of gold. Those little apples of gold, you can fill them out in the pew, but you can use your speech like apples of gold. And I don't know about you, but I would love to receive an apple made of pure gold. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like a whole bushel of apples of gold? And the Scripture teaches us that we can do that by what we say. We can use our mouths with discretion, and now, instead of causing hurt and anxiety and a fire which is ablaze, which is out of control and burns things, we can now uplift and exhort and encourage. That's what discretion does. Use our speech properly. Lord.